My name's Joseph Lowe. I work in the Treasury, where I am head of economics in the public spending group inside the Treasury, and I look after the Treasury's guidance on how to derive public value from proposals to use public resources. It's called the Green Book, and it has supplementary guidance on business cases and how to work out what the best way to achieve a particular objective is. Actually, the remark about lawyers reminded me of what Mark Twain said, uh, which was that one lawyer in a town can make a tolerable living, but two can grow rich. <laughs> and, 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 and that's exactly right. But lawyers, of course, are paid to work out what goes wrong, which is why if you start doing a prenuptial agreement, you can probably fall out <laughs> extensively before you get together. <laughs> why wait for the, for the divorce? Um, I, I, j j just to be a bit trendy and, and fitting with being agile, I, I changed the, the subtitle of my presentation uh, for, from what's shown on the programme to Who Stole My Benefits, which uh, was only designed to get your attention with, with due homage to Who Moved My Cheese, if you know what I mean. But the thinking is much the same. And, and actually the message from the two previous speakers was, if you don't design it right, uh, the thing will never get off the ground, and if it does limp into the air, it'll crash. And, and absolutely designing it right it is at the key. And, and to do that, you need to do a number of things and avoid a number of things. Mind mapping, yeah, wow, I love it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think anybody thinks linearly, really. It's only after we've sorted it all out. Because when you first start to think of something, it's in what a previous colleague of mine called the messy spaghetti stage, where it's all jumbled up. And you have to kind of tease the strands out and lay them and produce order into the things. And uh, I've always found mind mapping a good way to do that. You can sort of dump it all out on the page and then kind of organise it for yourself to see. But good intentions and the enemies of benefit is kind of where I want to start from. Um, get me over the financial hurdle, will you? Just write me a business case. You, you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. uh, retrofitting happens. Yeah? It's not uncommon. A previous head of the civil service and cabinet secretary said to me a couple of years ago when I was discussing this phenomenon with him, oh, it's, it's not as bad as it used to be, you know. He said, well, when I joined the civil service in the 70s, uh, all the people at the top were, were classical scholars. They were terribly clever people, especially in ancient Greek and such. But they, they sort of were, I don't really do numbers. I have a little man who runs a few up for me. Um, <laughs> and I have dinner at the club. Now... <laughs> It's not like that now, he, as he rightly pointed out. But it is a little bit, in some places, too often, a bit ad hoc. We're all terribly clever people, we have a problem, a few of us will go in a room and decide what to do. We'll make it up. We'll think on the hoof. We'll try very hard. I'm afraid the image of the civil service was set after the Trevelyan exams were introduced in the late 19th century. Prior to that, you bought your place, much as you bought a commission in the army before they introduced the professionalism in the army. And the image they had, my old politics lecturer when I was at university, said it was the apotheosis of the dilettante. The apotheosis being the highest point, and a dilettante is someone who, who cultivates an interest in something but doesn't really understand it. And it was the theory of the generalist the supreme civil servant in the late 19th century needed to be someone who could look at the wider world, look at the ministers in tray, work out what was important, set the most important things before them, manage their agenda, not let them get into any difficult holes and think about three months ahead. And have a broad idea of the, the national interest and stuff like this. Now, we've moved on a bit since then. But we're only up to about 19, blah, 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 somewhere in the mid-20th century. We're not in the 21st century culturally, which is a problem. But we've got some very clever people. And the issue is partly about moving the culture forward. We know what's needed. Yeah, come across that one. Don't bother me with a business case. We know what to do. Give me an implementation plan. Happens quite a lot. We can outsource the risks, don't worry, we'll pass them on to someone else. What about when it doesn't work? When you've spent all that money and the lawyers come in and then the bill starts to mound really high. A large slice of the £12,000 million that was spent unproductively on a single patient record for the National Health Service 
between about, I don't know, the early noughties and, and, and 2010 was spent on lawyers' fees at the end of the day. Because the contract said to the participants, uh, if you don't deliver, you ain't going to get paid and we'll give your work to someone else. This is macho stuff, this. Real harsh contract stuff, red in tooth and claw. Did it deliver? No. Over 12 billion down the drain, nothing to show for it. Hmm, interesting. Welsh government opted not to do that. They said, uh huh, no, no, we'll look closely. What do we need to do? And they designed something more modest that fitted the bill and delivered it. It was less than half a billion. It's working to this day. It's all to do with design. It's all to do with understanding where you are. Don't slow me down with this costly bureaucracy. That's what it's about. You're just adding costs by wanting a business case, aren't you? Just do it. Time and again. It's, it's positioned as a match can do attitude. I say that in the Treasury that doesn't work. Well, one of the Treasury's values, and we have a number of values, is collaboration. Collaborative working, and it figures in, in the week annual uh, review process. I mean, th th there's a lot of things that I might issue with in Treasury practices, but, but that isn't one of them. It's very, very strong on collaborative working, which is a, is a good thing. That, I mean, uh, I spent over 20 years in, in, in the energy industries, uh, in, in the parent companies of uh, British Gas and in, in its subsidiaries, a little bit of time in electricity and, and oil for that matter. But prior to that, I was in metals and mining and, and stuff, and then as a consultant. So this Treasury job is my fun job. It's my retirement job. I'm, I'm doing it to, to earn some extra money and, and um, uh, have, have a lot of fun and do something decent. And I have to tell you, the Treasury is the most fun place to work. You could imagine, if you enjoy 12-hour days or occasionally longer, not being regarded well for it always and, and never knowing what's going to happen next and, and all the chaos that politics brings. Um, but you do get occasionally to make a small difference and that, that's what keeps most of the people there working there, frankly. Um, now, the things above, they're the mother and father of all disasters. And time overruns, naturally. Follow universal credit. Tony mentioned it. Absolutely. You must remember the furore in, in, in the press when universal credit was introduced. Every politician wants to reform the tax system. Every politician wants to reform the benefit system because they're so complex and difficult and sometimes do things that are not only counterintuitive but counterproductive to the aims of the people who introduced them. And yet, Every new politician wants to do something new, and so it's easier to introduce a little extra bit than it is to reform the whole thing, which is always very contentious and difficult. On top of that, if you have another agenda, which is to reduce the costs, and you want to do it in an impossibly short time, then you are in trouble. And of course, universal credit is, is, is late and is not delivering exactly what was thought, and so on. And that's in the public domain, so I'm safe to say so. But time overruns mean that things cost more, and if they cost more, even if the benefits are fully delivered, and question are they, the costs are eating into the benefits, so the net benefit is less. Because it's your money. My money too. That's being spent. Good old Standish Group. This is a really old slide. But the thing is, the newer ones are much the same. They're a small American consultancy. They run a thing called the Chaos University. <laughs> it's to help companies fix their rotten program and project management. And they survey the companies and say, tell us how you're doing and we'll feed you back average figures and everyone else and you can see how, 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 how you're improving or not. It gets their foot in the door. It's a typical consultant's trick. Uh, 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 uh. Um, but, you know, this, the, 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 these are some of the top companies in, in the world. A fair slice of them. Now, in the public sector, we have a more difficult job than that. If that, that's a selection of some of the things that, that government does. It's not everything. If it, as a Venn diagram, it's a bit of a failure, actually. A, you can hardly read it, and B, it doesn't adequately capture the overlap between those things. But it's there to give you the idea. What we do in one place affects what happens somewhere else. And in the 21st century, when government is highly interventionist, compared even to the post-1945 government, and certainly compared to the 1890 government, it's involved in every aspect of life. 
public expectation is that government will be joined up. We just don't expect government to score own goals against the public interest. And yet the complexity of this is enormous, as a moment's reflection must, must reveal. Um, if welfare isn't intimately connected with public health and green growth, what is? But if green growth doesn't actually affect employment and economic growth, and if energy supply isn't involved with that, and if transport policy is not involved with that, and if they don't infect the environment, what does? And if some of that doesn't eventually feed back into education, crime rates, drug abuse, health costs, care costs, security, of course it's all connected. Of course it's all connected. So we have a tough job in the public sector. Actually, We've got some marvellous guidance worked out during the last 30 years, but the size of the beast, you try to hunt an elephant with a pea shooter, you can hit the elephant time and again, it's got a really thick skin and it's really big, it doesn't notice. Ministers come and go, they all have an agenda, even shorter lifespan than your average chief executive has been referred to here. They all want to make an impression. You can't make a change. And why do people become chief executives and ministers apart from, you know, it's a good living? They want to make a change. They want to make a difference. They want to be well regarded. We can't make a change if you don't do something. Lord Brown of Maddingley, the former chair of BP, when he was brought into government under Cameron, he was, he was the government's most senior uh, non-executive director. He's been in the cabinet office, wrote a report at the request of David Cameron into our major projects in the, in the early days of the Major Projects Authority. And it was called Getting a Grip. Hint in the title? Not loosening or just maintaining, getting a grip. And he made about 35, 36 recommendations. I was really pleased to see that about 32, 33 of them were to do things that were already in the guidance. Wonderful. The, 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 the other one, was, one, of the, one of the other ones was that ministers should refrain from making detailed announcements, confine themselves to general statements of intent, allow their officials to go away and find out and discuss what could actually be achieved with the resources and in the time span envisaged. Um, unfortunately, making sure that happens is a bit above my pay grade um, <laughs> and power and even influence. But... We do live in a democracy, and um, the more we educate and train people across the piece, within government and in the organisations who work with us collaboratively, the more this understanding leaks into general understanding and becomes understood by the parliamentary committees, and the more forensic becomes their questioning. And, and really, that, that is going to be a good thing for the long-term delivery of public value. Um, because just grandstanding and bashing people over the head is all very well, but it doesn't actually get to the heart of the problem of why things didn't work. And it's the difference between sort of uh, John, John Humphreys on the one hand and Evan Davis on the other. Evan Davis on Newsnight will sort of peel the onion a bit, um, whereas uh, John Humphreys just sort of squashes it like that. And, and, and it's only by peeling the onion that you get to the centre and find out what's going on. There's an intrinsic tension between ambition and reality that chief executives and ministers share. There's getting something done. And, 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 and reality is about the objective analysis of what's possible and what you have. And this isn't going to go away, which is why it comes back to collaboratively designing the thing so that it's likely to fly. The more complicated it is, obviously, the more difficult that task. Now, we have a thing called the five case model, which is a framework and a set of processes and some tools. It's no more than that. It doesn't tell you what to think, but it gives you a structure and a shared framework and a shared taxonomy that you can use to share thinking and develop things. And that's immensely useful, given the diversity of, of professions that are involved and, and the breadth over which we need to do it. It support, supports a joined up structured approach to thinking to try and avoid the pitfalls. Because after all it's the pitfalls, the unknown unknowns of Donald Brunsfeld that are the enemies of benefits. Um, it allows the optimum scoping 
a, a, an option selection of possibilities. You, you look at the optimum scoping of the proposal and then the possibilities for different options of delivering that. And you select the one that you think is most likely to, to work and to deliver the benefits realistically. And that means you have to actually understand and manage the risks. And Tony's absolutely right. Developing that, that analysis, that identification, that risk management is so important in government. Designing the contract, David, absolutely correct. And doing it in the right way. And certainly having methods where it's very complex, either commercially or technically, that require you to interact with providers before you go to them. Common sense. I think you can have a thing called competitive dialogue legally, can't you, which lets you do that. I know that's not been popular with all ministers at all times, but actually it's, it's, it's common sense. It's about planning the delivery. Finally you get the money, but it's conditional and it's checked. And it's about managing the delivery and the benefits, crucially with arrangements to monitor with feedback as you go forward. Tony's quite right, you often need pilot projects. And anyway, shouldn't everything be treated as something which isn't set in stone, but is monitored so that as you go forward you can learn from your implementation? Shouldn't you have continuous improvement? Now obviously I can't do this in Mandarin because I'm not that clever. And anyway, I'm not pitch perfect as well, which I think you need to be. Why have I got it in Mandarin? Well, 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 it's because of the three regular presentations that I do off by heart, really, to people from around the world who come to the Treasury all the time. If I don't do one a month, it's a surprise to one country or another, or one massive state or another. I've done them to the state of Gujarat, I've done them to the state of Botswana, I've done them to the whole of South Africa, you know, Colombia, Brazil, Nigeria, whatever. In China, there are so many arms of the state and different banks and commercial organisations, as well as the finance ministry, the economic ministry, the development ministry, they've all had the same presentations. The last time I did this one, so I don't know what it says in English, um, the guy stopped me right at the beginning, Mr Lowe, please don't give us that. We've got copies of all this back in Beijing, and we've got a translation of the Green Book, and we've got a translation of your business case guidance. What we'd like is an hour and a half, one-to-one, Q&A with you about how to work it in practice and how we deal with the problems. Fine, let's do that. It was a really interesting session. What it did was show me yet again that even with a completely different political system, not democracy as we understand it, with completely different power structures, the basic human behaviour problems are exactly the same. When I talk to people from Gujarat two weeks later, it was exactly the same. It's about human behaviour and managing that as much as anything else, as well as the technology. Now, the supplementary guidance to the Green Book is regarded throughout the world very, very highly. It's not perfect, but it's very, very good. I've just had to redraft it. I finished that just over 15 months ago, and since that time it's been going through a torturous consultation process. Not that it wasn't consulted on at every stage while I did it, but government is government. And, and actually, as much of it is, is to reassure senior people in the Treasury who, who, who um, uh, leave me to get on with it most of the time, but now we're doing something bold, want to just check that it's all right, you know, before, before diving in. Um, that I can't blame them, really. Um, we're in the final stages of, 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 of approval now. Hope it will be published autumn, late autumn. Um, and and uh, I, I think it, it, it's basically the same, but it's a lot clearer and, and, and has a lot more early strategic stuff about business cases in, in the Green Book itself rather than the supplement. We don't waste your money on expensive 3D technology in the Treasury, so that's my amateurish attempt to represent a five-sided pyramid viewed from the top. It's an austere pyramid, all right? <laughs> it's the five-dimensional model. They're not five cases. It's one object. They're five sides of the same damn thing. There are strategic issues about where we are, what the problem is, what we need to do about that, what we want to achieve. 
the economic case actually is about what is the value we're going to deliver to the public? This is where the benefits come in. What is the net value? Because it's the government, it's the benefit to the public. If it was a private company, it could be what are the wider benefits to the company because the financial thing isn't just what it's going to cost, it might be what it's going to do to the bottom line. And in a private sector thing, the economic thing could be about what about the company's long-term strategy? What about brand value? What about our market share? What about all kinds of other things that we consider strategically important? The commercial thing is exactly about designing the contract. And do you know, strangely, you can't send individuals off into their little rooms to write these things separately. Do you think people ever do that? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> Crazy? Or what? Most of the analysis takes place in the so-called economic case. Can they really do that without information flowing back and forth between their colleagues in the commercial side that do, 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 do the, the, the commercial side of things and the purchasing without information shared and exchanged with the colleagues in the financial case, without understanding the strategic objectives and following on from that and involving the people who, who did that? And can they really do it without knowing how it will be delivered? And can you put together a proposal for delivering it without having delivery and management specialists involved from the start. It's like trying to design an aeroplane with, with no, no knowledge of aeronautics. It would be insane. But people do. People do these things. The five case model says they should not. So there's a lot more. It's about changing the culture. It's about working across professional disciplines Green Book says that now, or the new one does. I can't imagine that anyone's going to take that out. Not even number 10 or a special advisor in number 10. I can't see them being against that. Um, working as a virtual team from the start. It's about holding workshops to share and check information and provide feedback at certain stages regularly to ensure that that cooperative working is taking place. It's about consultation with rele relevant stakeholders early on and right through the right stages of the process to see that you've correctly understood the situation and what is possible and what some of the trade-offs may be. It's about saying you need some external review at key stages of development. You need gateways, health checks to see that you are covering the right basis. All this is on a proportionate basis. Okay, we don't have infinite resources, but it has to be scaled according to the costs and the risks involved to both the public sector and to the public. It's no good doing something that's very cheap for the public sector if the impact on the public, well, the, the risk to the public is huge. You have to put the resources in to getting that right. And it's about understanding that this is not a linear process. It's roughly linear, but it's highly iterative. So you have to be prepared to backtrack, to jump back, to re-examine things, and then to go forward again. Now, learning from the past, we need to understand the problem. What do we really know? What is the evidence base? So we can't just say, doesn't matter about that, give me an implementation plan. You've seen it'll never happen again. You've seen, regrettably, it on the news recently, haven't you? Awful. Well, like building regs wouldn't let you build a new building like that, would they? No. Question is... The refurbishment regulations have that in or not? I don't know, but I guess they probably don't. But if you're going to have things that will never happen again, and we see this every few months, there's always something on the TV, it's gone wrong, we'll learn lessons, it must never happen again. Well, it's no good if the report from the investigation goes into a bottom drawer or is put on a shelf to gather dust. There has to be a compelling process that says, look at the evidence, look for past experience. If there isn't a compelling process, and that is the business case process, then those reports won't be found, won't be rediscovered, won't be dusted off, won't be read. So the business case process is very important to ensure that the mistakes are learned from. We have to know what business as usual looks like. So, oh no, it's, it's do nothing. No, it's not. If the roof leaks, you put out buckets to catch the drips. And if the leaks are going to get bigger, you've got to buy bigger buckets and empty them more often. We want to know that. Because we want to know what difference your proposal 
your intervention in the status quo is going to make because the status quo is not static. The world's dynamic as well as being joined up and we react to it day to day. So business as usual is really important to understand. We provide services, not assets. HS2, if it ever gets built, I suppose it probably will, something labelled HS2 anyway, um, isn't there to be a nice shiny train. It's there to provide transportation services between certain points in the UK at a predefined level of safety, at a certain speed, at a level of comfort that passengers, customers will find acceptable and want to use. It's a service provider, that's all it is. Everything we do is about service provision. Health services, justice services, defence services, environmental services, care services. So even if people think they're delivering an asset, the real question is what's it for, how does it work, how will it function? Is it actually appropriate for the function it's to perform? Because if it's not, it's going to fail and your benefits will be imaginary, so they'll never materialise. So, minimum core requirements for the solution are quite important. What is the core solution? What is the least you can do to deliver the benefit that you really want? If you don't know what the least you can do is, how will you know whether you've gold-plated your solution or not? Isn't it always the case that when we make a change, even business continuity, there are happy instances where we can make things better. And we see opportunities to improve things, and we take them. But how do we know whether the cost of that is justified by the additional benefits? We only know if we've got a core requirements benchmark. So we know that, yes, we're loading on some extra cost here, but we're going to deliver these extra benefits and we think that they're worth having. Now, the question mark arises, are they really benefits? Can you really de de deliver them? Deal with that in a minute. The other thing is, are we joined up across government? That's tricky. Has this lovely institution, Wednesday Morning Colleagues, you know, Perm 6 will get together, and leaders. Has this other lovely institution, Cabinet Government. Look how big government is. Look how complex government is. Very, very limited what those colleagues, what those ministers can really deal with on an ongoing basis. Of course they do some coordination. Of course it's very valuable. Is it enough? Of course it's not enough. There have to be things in the process to bring that about so that only the really big things that need to get to those people get to those people and the other things are dealt with as we go through. Collaborative working across government is what we have to try to create. And yet we all know how naturally silos arise in a large organisation. You know how many people work in the Treasury? Between eight and 900. That's it. Do you, how many, do you know how many people face us in DWP? A couple of hundred thousand. That's just one ministry. Do you think all 800 in the Treasury deal with public spending? Nah, about 300. The others are all doing very, very important things. International work, macro work, fiscal, borrowing the money we haven't got looking at taxation design to get more money, lots of other stuff. We need to be joined up across government. We need to work collaboratively. You'll be familiar with this kind of landscape. All the stuff that goes on, you know, politics, economics, social developments, technology, they drive policies, strategies, initiatives, expectation, don't they? And actually, out of that should come programmes projects, related activities are part of programmes, usually, not always, some projects are standalone, but they're about transforming the business, as, as, as Tony rightly said, and, and changing our operational capacity and the services that we deliver in one way or another to achieve outcomes, and those outcomes are the things that deliver the benefits. What we're doing is we're changing our business outputs. The outputs then affect society and the outcomes that happen. And if we're really lucky, those outcomes are beneficial, hence their benefits. That's not just pedantic messing with the nomenclature. That is actually the causal chain of what you can and can't do. So you're managing the right outputs that hopefully will have the right outcomes at the right cost at the right time 
that will be beneficial. So we don't deliver benefits directly. We make internal changes to our business, of course we do. We deliver more, better, cheaper, different outputs, even business continuity. Um, if they're not beneficial, we have to know why not. And this comes back to the proposed chain of causation, the old Latin thing, you know, post hoc ergo propter hoc. One thing happening after another doesn't necessarily mean that it was caused by the first thing. We don't want this casual thing. I saw this, it happened after that, therefore we'll, we, we, we know what's going on. At the beginning of the process, there has to be a rational and robust justification of why we expect the outcomes to follow from our changed outputs and why that's going to be beneficial. And there has to be some objective basis for that. If there isn't, it's pie in the sky. And, you know, instead of like the Wright brothers limping off the ground, you'll be like Icarus falling to the ground when you try and fly and just jump off the cliff. We start with the five case model by saying, well, you should look at the constraints you've got to work with them. There'll be political constraints, there'll be legal constraints, there'll be ethical constraints. If you don't do that, it's going to be invalid. What are the dependencies beyond your control? It's no good delivering a marvellous new project, product if, in fact, the infrastructure to support that product is either not present or is patchy or is inadequate, because then it won't be applied. Implicit assumptions are the absolute killer if people don't do this, because they are your unknown unknowns. They're the assumptions people didn't know they made. That's where all the hidden risks are lurking. We deal with all that stuff in a methodology we have for strategic long list analysis, which is really neat, and it's in our training programme. Optimism bias, as Tony rightly points out, exists. It's a global phenomenon. Old Bent Fluvier up at the um, Said Business School has made a lifetime lucrative career out of that. Um, optimism bias. It's a very simple idea. You wouldn't think you could milk a thing like that that well, could you? But, you know, he's a very clever guy, obviously. Good at milking. Um, goodbye to Goldilocks. What's that got to do with it? Do you know the story? I'm getting, if you, have you heard me go on about Goldilocks before? I do like fairy stories. They help people to remember things. She's a rough sleeper. She's in the woods. She's tired. She's hungry. Finds an abandoned house. Looks abandoned. The door's open. Looks inside. There are three chairs. One is too big. One is too small. And one's just right. And they're sat at a table set with food. And opposite the big chair, the food is too cold. And opposite the small chair, the food is too hot. But opposite the chair that's just right, the food is perfect. So she gets on the chair and she eats the food. She's then tired, she wants to sleep. There are three beds. There's a big one, it's very untidy, doesn't fancy it. There's a small one, hasn't been made up. There's one that's just right and it's perfect. So she gets in and goes to sleep. End of story, she's very happy. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Bears are not teddy bears. They're not anthropomorphic. They are dangerous, inquisitive omnivores. They don't like you going into their house. They don't like you stealing their food. The bears come home. They eat her. <laughs> right? that, that, that's the reality. Why? She had implicit assumptions. She didn't do her risk analysis. <laughs> she, she could have just nicked the food and run. When you see, if you're on approvals committee and you see a business case with three options, one of them is kind of viable and the other two are obviously ridiculous. It's a Goldilocks case. And what that's telling you is, we had a bright idea, we haven't done any real in-depth thinking about it, we can't show you some proper analysis, we've cobbled it together, retrofitted this thing, and the two other things are there. Either we think you're stupid and won't notice, or we think you will collude with us in just rubber stamping this because all we know is that business cases are a waste of time, just do it. That's what it's telling you. It's that mentality. So when you see a business case like that, if you're an approvals committee, you should say, right, as a responsible official, I can't possibly approve this. They obviously haven't thought through this and done their adequate analysis 
risk analysis and everything else from the start. So it's goodbye Goldilocks in both senses of the word. I bet you don't forget that now. <laughs> so constraints, legal, ethical, social standards, been through all that. Critical success factors, we believe in those. They should know all about the constraints and the dependencies. They should also know about the business needs. What are the business needs? They're about those changes we know we have to make in the business in order to change our service outputs. Those transformations we have to make in the business. Those are the business needs. Because right at the beginning, we set some smart objectives. I don't need to tell you what smart objectives are. You know, don't you? Yeah? So your critical success factors are informed by constraints and dependencies and business needs. And with our five case model, they say, well, there's a number of options in here. Will each option meet the business needs? Which ones will, which ones won't? Will it provide a strategic fit with the wider interests of government? Will it appear likely to give us value for money? Because we haven't done a detailed analysis yet, but you know, at a, at a global sort of indicative level. Is it likely to be achievable? Does it really reflect supply side capacity and, and capability? And does it appear that it's likely to be affordable? That those are the things. And we actually then disaggregate the long list choice into a series of stages. And we do them from the perspective of, of uh, service delivery as a, se as a sequence of different option choices. And in that, the analysis, the identification and, 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 and the management of risk is crucial. Because it, is, because it is the failure to, opti to, to optimise risk management which kills benefits. I've got one minute. The five levels of choice are, what is the right scope for this thing, for it to deliver what we need? That was where 12 billion went down the drain with the single patient record. They didn't scope it correctly and it led to every other mistake as a consequence. What is the best technical means of delivering that, that scope of change. What is the best organisation to do that? It's sort of who, the provider. Is it an organisation? Is it a new organisation? Is it public? Is it private? Is it a hybrid? Do we need to create a new market? Do we need to pass a regulation? What's going on here? What's the right implementation plan to make this viable? What's it going to cost? How's it going to be paid for? And each of those is confronted with the CSFs, and the objectives and the business needs. From that, when it does all those things, you can assemble a short list of options that you can do your detailed analysis on. And you do it in a structured way. It's like a filter. We've got training on it since December 2013 when we introduced our training programme. APMG will tell you all about that. We've got 18, 19 providers in the UK who will train you. It includes many, many professional trainers. It includes the Charter Institute of Public Finance and Accounting. It includes Deloitte, who are here today. It includes PA Consulting, who are not here today. It includes lots of people. They're training. We've trained over 5,300 people. It's a huge market. And you know, 5,300 is a lot. It's a drop in the ocean compared to the requirement and compared to the potential, but it's only this that will deliver the transformative culture change that we need to make our guidance into an intelligently applied reality and that will enable you then to have some realisable and deliverable benefits. Thank you.